So on with the piano edit, and um, I just want to check something. Um, before I took a break at the end of the last little bit, I, I was talking about you know creating, dragging copies away uh, from single notes and from chords to get additional notes in chords, uh, or to make chords from a single note, and how the that whole limit dragging thing helps to keep the fronts exactly lined up. Yeah. And as I was doing that, I was kind of lassoing the chord repeatedly and saying, you know, now it's C major 7, and um, now it's C7, etc. Well, I was referring to this information box up here. I don't know if I made that clear. So I lassoed this chord, and there are four notes. And it says up here, 4 selected, C7. It tells you the name of the chord, which is brilliant. And that's really useful for helping beginners who know nothing about music to l l understand... Um, the structure of chords better because, like, you know, if I push this top note up, oh, right, now it's C major 7, and then I flatten that top note, and now it's C7. Okay, so I know it's the 7th, now I drop it down, oh, right, now it's C6. See what I mean? You always get the name of the chord up here, and it really helps uh, beginners to learn more about structures of chords in terms of the intervals between notes and what kind of chords that creates. And of course, it's really useful when you're building chord progressions as well, right? So. I just wanted to make sure that you notice, though, that the this this chord, the, the name of the chord is being displayed in the um, in this info display box up there, right? Okay. Alrighty, so um, let's get on with this piano edit, and uh, this is a good time now to introduce the MIDI out monitor. There it is. You can click this little icon, and it turns green, and uh, once this MIDI out monitor um, is activated, you get audio feedback from your piano edit. Um, so. For example, when you click on the keys, you hear the pitch. Really useful, so you can click on a key and get the pitch before you pencil in the note. Uh, you get pitch when you click on a note. It plays back the note, so you know what, it's, what the pitch is. Uh, when you pencil in notes, you hear pitch. Um, when you move a, chord, a note around in pitch, Right, so you get hold of a note and move it in pitch, and you hear the pitch as you adjust it. Really useful for changing the pitch of a note because you get to hear the pitch as it's changed. Now, the other thing that is incredibly useful is you get an arpeggio when you drag through a chord. Again, great in combination with the information box telling you the name of the chords. Um, because you can drag through a chord and hear the notes just spaced apart a bit and it gives you much more of an idea of what the notes are doing within that chord to make decisions about which note to move to do things, you know. Etc. Alright, so MIDI out monitor, very useful, but at other times it can, if you have notes sounding when you move them around, it can clash with notes being triggered by the playhead after the player has passed the thing you're editing, so it's not always good to have it on, but Anyway, it's a good feature, so there it is. Let's turn it off for now. Dance music and electronic music, because the roots of that kind of music comes from hardware sequences, um, it has this reoccurring theme of this use of rows of notes in patterns going da 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 or da 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 things like that. You get this a lot in electronic, in electronic music, dance music, and you get it in pop music as well because it crosses over so heavily with those two genres. So there's this when we're when we're building these sort of electronic, modern pop, dance music, etc. type compositions, we use this technique a lot of drawing in these rows of repetitive notes, sixteenths, etc. So let's look at that now. Um, we know from the rules that when you pencil in a note even if the snap is on ticks, it will always snap its beginning edge to a to a, a grid line. Okay, that's the first thing we know. Um, so if I want to put in a row of sixteenth notes, I have to make sure my grid and division are set to sixteenths, and by now you know how to do that. You drag on the division quantity in, down here on the transport bar, right? And it changes the division and the grid to match. So now we're in sixteenths. And it has to be in sixteenths to put in a row of sixteenth notes because every note has to snap to a grid line when I put it in with the pencil. So I get a pencil tool, I put in a note, 
And then I've got to use a snap of ticks to drag that note to be shorter than a sixteenth in length. And then I pencil in my row of sixteenth notes. There they are. And uh, once they're penciled in, I can lasso the entire lot with the pointer tool or another way to um, select all the notes on a key is to click the key. So you click the piano key and it highlights and selects every note on that pitch in uh, one or more regions that you're editing, right? Okay, so now they're all highlighted. Uh, I can use a snap of ticks to drag them all to be as short and staccato or longer and more legato that's legato being where one note spills into the next without any real gap so I can make them as legato or staccato as I want okay so they're all highlighted backspace to delete okay uh, if I want to put in 30 seconds again I must put my grid to 30 seconds because each note must snap to a grid line and I pencil in my first note drag it shorter and then pencil in 32 notes. It's very laborious and I have to be quite accurate with the mouse. It means keeping the mouse quite still and moving it in tiny steps and I tell you if you do this a lot over a session of sequencing over a day I mean it, it wears you down. There's my 30 seconds which again could be dragged once they're all highlighted in length by selecting a snap of ticks and then you drag them in and out to be as long as you want right. 64 is an even bigger nightmare you've got to put six deforces your grid and division and then pencil in your first note and make sure it's dragged to be shorter than a 64th and then pencil in being very accurate with the mouse I have to pencil in my 64th now I can either do that across the bar or I can pencil in just a beat's worth up to the first beat line and highlight the whole lot and copy them command C then I can snap the player in you, you can grab the player and drag it around you can snap it to grid lines so I snap it to the next beat line and paste in my next beat's worth of 64ths and then snap the player to the next beat and command V paste in my next beat's worth of 64ths and snap the player to the last beat line and there you go, paste in my final beat's worth of 64ths and there is my row of 64ths which can be then highlighted and dragged to be whatever length you like as a group and um, even using that copy and paste technique it was still long winded. It's a lot of mouse work and it's it's a pain and it worse still if you do this a lot it really gets to your mousing hand you know because you have to keep holding that mouse hand and making these tiny you know these very accurate movements with the mouse stepping notes in it's it's it just it's not good <coughs> so let's look at ways other ways of inputting rows of notes i'll put the grid back to sixteenths um and it's now time to introduce ourselves to our step input keyboard. Yay! And now we can get into step input programming. So step input keyboard and this is really really good for inputting rows of notes very fast. Okay. Um, it's really simple to use. We have the keys along the bottom and you simply click on those with the mouse for the pitch that you want to input per step. Then we have these note value or step value buttons here okay, that go from a whole note which is a note that lasts the whole bar in length up through half note, quarter note, eighth, sixteenth, 32nd, 64th and 128th, right? So you choose your step value. I'll choose 16th. And then the only other thing to choose is the velocity. And that's these buttons here from PPP to FFF. And this is all in musical score speak, you know, it's all in Italian and all that. Yeah, so, you know, it goes from a low velocity of 16 up to 127 full of velocity. So I'll choose F, which is 96. OK, so I've chosen a velocity of 96. I've chosen a 16th for my step value. Ignore all the other buttons and features, and that's it in its basic sense. And you just put the playhead like that. I'll snap it to this division line, and uh, we happen to be in 16th. And you input a note. And when you do, what happens is uh, the, 
the playhead then steps forward by the step value of a sixteenth and leaves behind a note exactly a sixteenth in length. Okay, so you just input your notes like that, you see. And each time you input a note, the playhead steps forward by the step value and leaves behind a note of the same value. So now to input a row of sixteenths, we just put the playhead at the very, very beginning of the bar, snap to the first beat, choose sixteenths, choose the velocity we want, go to our note required and click on it sixteen times. Bosh, a row of sixteenths. Highlight the lot and with a snap of ticks, then drag our resulting row of sixteenths to be as short and staccato or as long and legato as we like. A legato means where one note spills into the next year, so we can have them staccato, short and stabby, or legato spilling into each other or whatever we like. Okay, done and dusted. A row of 16. It's really simple, right? Want to put in a row of 30 seconds? It's even easier than penciling in. Choose 30 seconds, choose the velocity you want, snap the player to the first beat of the bar, choose your note and click on it 32 times. Da, 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 da. There you go, row of 30 seconds. Highlight the lot, make them as short or as long as you want. 30 seconds. Um, I don't know, by the way, I don't know if I've told you this, but to highlight all these notes on the same pitch, I'm just clicking the key and it highlights everything on the same pitch, right? Okay. 30 seconds. Easy peasy. Much easier than penciling in. Uh, what about 64? Snap the player to the beginning. First beat of the bar. Choose 64. Whatever velocity you want. Choose your note. Whack in 64 notes. Just click on the pitch 64 times. Okay, you've still got to click 64 times, but you're not having to move the mouse or even grip the mouse. Just click. Once you position the mouse over the, the required note, you just click. How much easier was that than penciling them in? There, done. 64. And in a snap of ticks, drag them to whatever length you like. Yeah, so step input is very, very useful for putting in rows of notes. OK, so I'll put it back to 16. Now let's look at some of the other features. Um, first of all, the quantize. Well, quantize is off now. And another beauty of step input is that I can position the playhead anywhere I like, choose my step value, my velocity and whack in a row of, in this case, sixteenths, but that row of notes begins anywhere I like to position the playhead. And as I put in each note, the playhead steps forward by exactly a sixteenth, in this case, every time. So I can input a row of notes by the step value, in this case of sixteenths or any other step value, whereas when I pencil in, they have to snap to the grid. So I've put in a row of sixteenths there beginning exactly here and I know each note is spaced exactly apart by a sixteenth. And with the snap set to ticks I can drag them as a group to be as short as I like. Now to do that by the traditional pencil method, the only way to do it is you've got to pencil your notes in first, you know, and put the first note in, drag it to the decent length that is, you know, shorter than uh, the division you're working to and then I've got to pencil in my row of notes first, but they will snap to the grid, of course, so I've got to put my grid in sixteenths as well, if I want to put in sixteenths. But they're on the grid. When you pencil in notes, they're always snapped to the grid. So I then have to highlight the lot, and in a snap of ticks, then drag them to begin at that offbeat position. Or off, div you know, sort of odd position, not on a division line. Now I have the same thing. I have a row of sixteenths beginning here exactly spaced apart a sixteenth, but what a long-winded procedure compared to just putting the player where I want, leaving the quantize off, choosing my note value and whacking in my notes like that. I've got the same thing. Sixteenth apart, perfectly, exactly beginning where I like. In other words, we're putting them in at the step value, in this case sixteenths, by the step value, right? Once we put quantize on, then things snap to the grid. So I can put the player anywhere I like. In this case, for example, we're in sixteenths and I'm still in a step value of sixteenths. Now if I put the player right in the middle between two sixteenth division lines with quantize on, it will snap in the first note always to the first division working forward to the right from wherever the player is, if it's positioned in the middle of two divisions of the value that you're inputting, right? So I put it there and it begins it at the next division 
and then puts in subsequent notes spaced apart at sixteenths. Snapped this time to the grid because quantize is on. Okay, but um, if the playhead is slightly towards one or the other division lines of the value that you're step inputting, then it will always snap to the nearest one. Okay, so if I put the playhead there, the first note will be snapped to this division line at sixteenths with quantize on. Okay. And um, if the player is slightly towards, more towards this division line, it will put the first note in there and then step forward by the value. Yeah? Okay, so quantize is quite useful. Um, and the one thing you may have noticed is that I've, in all these examples I've just showed you, I've never had to change my grid. That's the other advantage of step input. You never have to change your grid. Step input keyboard knows where all the values are. So if I could turn my grid right off by setting my division to quarter beats. No division lines, right? But if quantize is on, logic step input keyboard knows where the value of the grid lines are. So I'll put the player anywhere I like. All right, I'm going to whack in 30 seconds now. Put in some 30 seconds. Put my grid to 30 seconds. Sure enough, logic's put them in, snapped exactly to 30 seconds, yeah? But it was the same when I was putting in all the other notes, yeah? Like when I was putting in rows of 16, so whatever, I put the player to the beginning of the bar like that. I don't need quantize on now. I've snapped the player to the beginning of the very first beat of the bar. I choose 16, so whack them in. But there's no need to change the grid like you have to do when you pencil in. These are exactly at 16. Huh. Huh. So no need to change the grid. That's the other advantage, yeah? Fantastic. Okay. Um, the channel button, forget that. You won't need to use that. Um, and that leaves just a few other front panel features. Let's have a look at those. I'll put the grid back to 16. So we'll... Okay, uh, we've got this chord button. Now, obviously, the reason we need that is because when we put in a note, we can only click with the mouse on the keys, right? So, okay, so I put in a, a note at this, you know, 16, for example. As soon as I do, the player steps forward by that value of a 16, ready to, to put in the next note. So you can't put in chords because as soon as you click, the player steps forward. Only one note can be clicked at a time, of course. So um, the object of the chord button is watch. You latch it. Okay, put in a note, but the player stays put, waiting for the next note of the chord while this chord button is latched. Right. So put in my next note. Here my next note, and there's my chord. Now I delatch, and the player steps forward. Ready to put in my next input. Relatch the chord button. Put in my next chord. And while the chord button is latched, the player stays put until I've inputted all my chord notes. Then delatch, and the player steps forward by the value ready for the next input. And I'll relatch the chord button and put in my final chord like that. And I've got three chords. Delatch the button. Like that, okay. It's the chord button. Also, we have some other buttons here in the middle. These three here. We've got the dotted note button, triplet note button, and sustain button. So let's look at the dotted note first. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this is another, again, a, a musical score thing. A, a dotted note is a note that's half as long again as the value of the note. So if you put a 16th note on a, a score line in a musical score and then put a dot after it, it means that note is half as long again as the value of the note. So I'll choose 16ths and latch the dotted note button and I put in a note and another note. And then the button D latches. And what I've got is I've got a Dotted note, which is a sixteenth in this case, that's the step value, f but half as long again. And then the next note that's put in is a little note to make up the distance. And the combination of those two notes, when you you know you highlight the dotted note button, click twice, and it delatches, and you're left with this dotted note and a little short note. The distance of the two combined is the same as two notes the regular length at the value. All right, so that's a dotted note. And then we have the sustain button. You put in a note and then click sustain. 
and it will just make that note sustain each time by the step value longer and longer each time you click it each time by the step value in this case sixteenths right okay, that's the sustain button and finally we have which the button which for me is the cream of the crop of these extras and that's this triplet button right next three notes are triplets so what I'm actually do is choose eights this time to show you this and I put the playhead here like that right snap to the first beat of the bar doesn't matter what my grid is in I'm in eights whatever velocity I like I'll put in my notes but I latch the triplet button one two three triplet button D latches I leave behind three notes relatch the triplet button one two three it D latches relatch one two three relatch one two three and I've now got a bar of triplets in eights let's put our division into eights now normally there'd be two eights per beat there's the two eighth divisions right but what we've done is we've put in triplets at eights so there are three notes per beat once you put them in, you highlight the lot and drag them to be as short as you like. And there's our triplets. OK, and if I just lower the tempo, let's put it down to like 80. Put the metronome on. I'll count that so you can hear what's actually happening if you don't know what triplets are. Just lower the volume a bit. OK, so I'll clap the count. One two three, one two three, one two three, one two three, like that. You, you've got, you've got, one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three, like that. Lovely sort of one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three. Beautiful triplet patterns. Really nice for doing kind of acidy triplet patterns over four beats. You know, four square beats and things. Very very useful. I love me triplets, me. Okay. Um, so that's all your front panel buttons as I say ignore the channel button you know you may you'd only need to use that if you were using hardware or you know some odd circumstances but if you're that far down the line that you know all about that I don't need to explain it but in everyday use just leave it alone you the track channelizes all the MIDI for you Right, well there are some other features for Step Input Keyboard, but we can only uh, access those extra features with key commands, right? And also, let's also assign a key command to toggle this Step Input Keyboard on and off, so we can quickly bring it in whenever we want to use it, rather than going here to Options and Step Input Keyboard each time, right? So let's go to our key commands. Logic Pro, Preferences, Key Commands, okay, and uh, what we want to do is search here for Keyboard, okay, there we go, and this is what you're looking for, Toggle Step Input Keyboard, so highlight it, click the Learn By Key Label, and I like to assign the toggling of the Step Input Keyboard to the Apostrophe Key, so with this Learn by key label button latched and toggle step input keyboard highlighted. Tap the apostrophe key. There we go, and you might see a little apostrophe there in this key column. And, and across from toggle step input keyboard, I can now delatch the learn by key label. Okay, so now we can assign toggling of our step input keyboard. We can bring it in any time we want by just using the apostrophe key. I suggest you use the apostrophe key because it's very easy to remember and it's not assigned to anything so uh, already so you're free to assign that that apostrophe key command to toggle the, the keyboard right okay right next step remove this search term right now that says nothing in the search box and the whole list opens out and then scroll right down the bottom right right to the bottom of the list and whether or not these triangular headers are expanded and open or not, what we're looking for is the third triangular header up from the very bottom, right? There it is, Step Input Keyboard. Go down the list, highlight Rest, Latch Learn by Key Label, and I assign this to Forward Slash. There we are, done. I use forward slash because it reminds me of taking a rest. You type www.blahblahblah, blah, blah, forward slash to take a rest, 
and then the rest of your address okay so that's why I use it and also it's not assigned to anything already so we're free to use it right so assign rest to forward slash we can't do step input programming without a rest command as you'll see okay and um, now look further down the list for delete highlight that and again with learn by key label latched I use the backslash key so now we've assigned the backslash key to delete right again I use backslash because it's related to forward slash they're related so I know forward slash steps forward and takes a rest backslash steps backwards and deletes also the backslash key is not assigned already so again you know we can freely assign it to that command logic will not pop up the warning you know saying oh you can't do that mate that key's already assigned you know Alrighty, so that's the delete assigned. Um, and now just go one further down, step backwards, highlight that, and again with learn by key label latch, assign that to your left arrow key. Step backwards is now the left arrow key. And now below that, step forward, highlight that, and again with learn by key label latch, press the right arrow key. So we've got left arrow to step back, right arrow to step forward, so that's it. Alright, so we've assigned the extras now, the toggling. We've assigned rest command to forward slash, delete command to backslash, and step forward and backward to the left and right arrow keys. That's it. Now D latch learn by key label, close your key commands. Right, okay, now we've got extra features. Not only can we toggle the keyboard on and off when we need it, but we've now got those extras. So let's look at those. Okay, now first of all, the rest. Very important. You can't do step in programming without it. So I'll choose sixteenths. Remember, no need to change my grid. Whatever velocity I like. And snap me player to the first beat of the bar. And uh, I'll put in a note. But now I'll press the rest key, forward slash. And the player steps forward by the step value exactly, leaving a rest. OK, so note, rest, note, rest, note, rest, note, rest, note, rest, note, rest. And what I've done is I've put in sixteenths but spaced apart by a rest each time and the result is I've got look the grid's in eighths what I've actually got is eighths that are exactly a sixteenth in length all you have to do is do some simple maths in your head halves and doubling right so if I want to put in a row of sixteenths that are exactly a thirty second in length no need to change my grid just choose thirty seconds Snap me player to the beginning of the bar, choose me note and put in no rest, no rest, no rest, no rest, etc. And the result is if I put my grid to sixteenths, right, I step inputted thirty seconds but leaving a thirty second rest between each note. And the result, if we put the grid into sixteenths, is that we've got sixteenths that are exactly a 30 second in length. Now, <coughs> how would you do that the traditional pencil way? Well, you'd have to, first of all, set your grid into 16s, pencil in your first note and then drag it to be shorter than a 16, then pencil in 16 notes. Yawn. And once they're in, you've then got to set your snap to division with snap to absolute value on highlight the lot and with the grid in 30 seconds drag the whole lot as a group to snap them to 30 seconds in length okay now we've got the same thing but what a palaver we've now got 16 exactly a 30 second in length but <laughs> with step input keyboard none of that faffing about it doesn't even matter if you've got a grid or whatever you know the grid doesn't have to be put to the value I've turned it off now look no. just snap the player to the first beat I want to put in 16 to 30 second in length so I choose 30 seconds played at the beginning whatever velocity no rest no rest no rest no rest done exactly the same thing 16 exactly a 30 second in length yeah easy peasy it's actually a rest <coughs> command, and also you can use it when you're doing the chords, you know, or whatever else to make the gaps that you want between the notes, you know. So I can latch my chord button, put me, uh, I'll go to sixteenths now, put in a 
note, call button wait, put him in X note, put him in X note, D latch. But whereas before, uh, you know, step forward and then I have either had to put a note or a chord in at the next step, I can rest. Forward by two rests, say, relatch the call button. Next chord. D latch, rest, rest, relatch the call button. Next chord. Now I put in three chords spaced apart. By whatever amount of rests I want. Okay. So that's your rest command. Can't live without it. Um, what else? We've got the delete as well. Remember, we assigned delete to backslash. Yeah. Shot. Let's have a look at that. I'm putting in sixteenths and I'm going along. Then. Nit, 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 oh no! I put in the wrong note. Right. No worries. Just backslash. <laughs> Played steps back. Delete the note. You're ready to put in the right note. Nit, nit, nit. Oh no! Wrong note. Backslash. No worries. Or backslash, backslash as much as you like, and then put in whatever you did want. Backslash, 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 input, 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 etc. Now, of course, as well as backslash, we can use the arrow keys to step forward and backwards. So I step back to there, backslash to delete the note, player steps back, ready to input the note I do want, then step forward to here, that's the wrong note there. So I step forward of that note, backslash to delete. Put the note in I did want and step forward ready to the to carry on programming or whatever you know you can step backwards and forwards to any position and to backslash and delete it will always delete the note working back you know from where the playhead is backslash players ready to put in the right note there you go forward and backward forward and backward and backslash to delete input the right note now, if you wanted to, for example, leave a rest, but there's a note there, you just step forward of the note, backslash to delete, and then rest forward. Or just step forward, you know, whatever. Yeah, so there's your commands. Easy peasy. Yeah? Step input keyboard. Brilliant. So now when we're working, no more faffing about. You're working away, none of that ghastly penciling in the notes, right? You're working away, you think, ah, right, I want to put a row of iats across this region. Sixteenths. But I want them short, a 30 second in length. No worries, mate. Toggle your step input keyboard. Set your step value to 30 seconds. No need to change the grid. Set the velocity. Play a snap to the first beat. Choose your height note. Note, rest, note, rest. Note, rest, note, rest, etc. Done and dusted. Row of hi hats on the right note. Sixteenths, but they're a 30 second in length, exactly. Simple as that. That's how we can now input our rows of notes. Easy peasy, mate. Okay, there you go. And you could combine, you know, like 64s, for example. Well, whack in 64s. Me, 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 If you want to, you can just do that many and then do the copying and pasting technique. Command C, copy the lot, snap the played, paste, snap the played, paste, snap the played, paste. But it's still easier than penciling in, is it not? You know, there you go. Step input keyboard, it's it's a godsend, right? Okay, now, so far we've looked at doing the step input programming by clicking on the keys here on this little keyboard. But you can also do step input programming using your external MIDI keyboard, right? Or you, you just use this step input keyboard exactly the same way. You have to have this open to do step input programming from an external keyboard. But you choose your step value here. You choose whether quantize should be on or off here. You choose if you want to use the dotted triplet or sustain buttons at any point. But the velocity is now coming from your master keyboard velocity as you hit the actual keys per step. And no need for a chord button anymore because you can press as many keys as you want per step. So we can also do step input programming without even having to click these keys from a real MIDI keyboard. So uh, let's look at that next. So step input programming but from a real MIDI keyboard. Well the truth is I uh, I don't actually have uh, a real MIDI keyboard attached to this Mac at the moment. I, I mean I've got a small footprint little control and master keyboard but I lent it to a friend who's using it to program with a laptop 
and I don't want to drag out a full-size keyboard from the cupboard and set it up on the stand and and um, wire it all up and all. No, forget that. Right. But due to the wonders of logic, I can still show you step input programming from a real MIDI keyboard by using the caps lock keyboard. All you do is toggle your caps lock so that your caps lock key is lit and then this caps lock keyboard appears this display okay now this is only a guide display you don't click on this um, it's there to show you what keys on your QWERTY keyboard are now doing what hence you can change its transparency because this must be open if you want to use your QWERTY keyboard as a MIDI keyboard but the but now we've caps lock and this has popped up we've turned our QWERTY keyboard into a real MIDI keyboard that is sending real MIDI notes into Logic just the same as if it was a, a, a master keyboard attached to the Mac. By latching our caps lock and bringing up this icon, our QWERTY keyboard attached to the Mac with a USB lead is now behaving exactly the same as a real master keyboard attached to the Mac with a USB lead. And if you've got a Mac laptop, it's the same thing. The QWERTY keyboard has been turned into a real MIDI keyboard but it's sending real MIDI notes into Logic, right? I can show you that. If you look at the little MIDI input and output monitors down here on the transport bar, right? These show, well, the input section here, this upper one, where it says no in by default. That shows any incoming MIDI activity coming into Logic, okay? Now, if you don't have this MIDI in and out display on your transport bar, you need to right click on the transport bar, choose customize transport bar and then look down this center list here and make sure MIDI activity is ticked. If it isn't, tick it and click OK. And then you will have that display here on your or transport bar. Now watch the MIDI input activity monitor. It, it, it shows any incoming MIDI coming into Logic. And now I click the step input keyboard keys. Now watch this little MIDI input monitor panel there, right? Look, no activity at all. Because when you click to put the notes in from this step input keyboard, it dumps the notes directly onto the piano grid, bypassing Logic's MIDI input completely, right? But now if you watch the same display as I press the QWERTY keys now, okay, you'll see this display respond because we're now sending real MIDI note data into Logic from our QWERTY keyboard because our QWERTY keyboard is now behaving as a real MIDI keyboard with real keys, black and white keys, right? So this uh, caps lock keyboard, this QWERTY keyboard is in the octave number two. We're in the second octave. So by looking at the guide here, I can see that the A key on my QWERTY keyboard is the first C white note. We're in an octave of two, so if I press the A QWERTY key, it will output the MIDI note C2 into Logic. So watch the display here again. Here we go. See? Look down here. It says C2, and the velocity is 76. Just there, look. Yeah? Because I'm pressing the C2 key and the velocity on this display says 76. Once you activate the caps lock keyboard you don't set your velocity here anymore you set it on the QWERTY keyboard display and you set your octave on the QWERTY keyboard display. Okay, But you still have to have the step input programming keyboard open to choose your step value and to use quantize or any of these additional buttons like the um, dotted the triplet or the sustain buttons, but no need for the core button anymore because we can obviously press more than one QWERTY key at a time. So we can input chords by just pressing as many keys as we want, just the same as a real MIDI keyboard, right? Okay, so let's look at the features on the little QWERTY caps lock keyboard, right? First, the octave, we set that by using the number keys across the top as the guide shows us, right? So we use the number keys 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 0 to set our octave which goes from minus 2 up to 7 so I'll press the number 5 QWERTY key number which is octave 2 
and then the velocity is set by using the bottom row of, uh, of uh, these keys here which is um, Z, X, C, V, B, N for November and M for Mike. Okay, and the preset velocities are Z is 10, X is 32. You just might see them changing in the video here where it says velocity there. Look, all right. So Z is 10, X is 32, C is 54, V is 76, B for Bertie or Bravo is 98. N for November is 120 and M for Mike is 127 and you can also set a custom velocity using the left and right angle bracket keys next to the M for Mike key and if you can just see this velocity display here changing as I go up and down with the left right angle bracket keys right so I set a custom velocity of um, 92 and that's it and you can then transparent this you know change the transparency so it doesn't clutter up your display because this has to be open to use the QWERTY keyboard right but now I can play in MIDI notes directly from my QWERTY keyboard and do step input programming by pressing the QWERTY keyboard as the keys as if I had a real MIDI keyboard no need to click here anymore so um, to do my step input programming from either a master keyboard or from the QWERTY keyboard the final step is I have to activate this MIDI step input monitor here. Okay, now just to note, right, very important, you might not see this on the video, but look at your own copy of Logic. When you latch this step input monitor button, it turns red and you see a little line drawing of a MIDI plug, but the middle of it is red. If by mistake you double click, it turns black. You don't want that. Just have it so it's red in the middle. OK, now we can do step input programming from a master keyboard or from our QWERTY keyboard, right? So all we do is we choose the step value, I'll choose sixteenths, put the player at the beginning and now I'll use the QWERTY keys to put in a row of sixteenths on D2. There you go, no need to press the keys, uh, click the keys here anymore. So we're not even using the mouse now. I like the lot. And in snap a tick, drag them as short as I want. Done. Brilliant. We can still use the rest key, of course. Um, I'll put in 30 seconds now. So uh, I'll put in my 30 seconds on D2. Here we go. I'm pressing the quarter keys now. Note. Rest. No rest. No rest. No rest. No rest. Oops. Backslash. Mistake. No rest, no rest, no rest, no rest, no rest, no rest. There we are, and I've done 16, it's exactly a 30 second in length. And if you were using a master keyboard, instead of the QWERTY keyboard, you just simply put the player at the beginning. But no need to choose octave, you just press the key you want on your master keyboard, just set your step value still, but no need to set, set anything else because your velocity comes from your keyboard. Put your player at the beginning, you can still use the rest key. You press your note on your keyboard, then the rest key on the quarter keyboard, note on your keyboard, rest key on the quarter keyboard, note on your keyboard, etc. Same thing. Done. Yeah, brilliant. So now it's even easier. If I want to put in a row of 64ths, I don't even have to click anymore. I'm just using the quarter keyboard now. So I put my player at the beginning, choose 64ths, and uh, put in a row of 64ths. Just tap on the quarter key. Go on, my son. Go on. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, no more mouse clicking, and there's a row of 64s. Easy peasy. Highlight like the lot, and in a snap of ticks, drag them as short as you want. Bada bing, bada boom. There you go. All right, so caps lock keyboard. Very useful. So now, when we're working, even if we don't have a MIDI keyboard, All we do is this. We go, oh, I want to put a row of 16ths, like hi-hats or something, across this region. All right, fine. That, that would probably be off that uh, input bu monitor button there. So we toggle our step input keyboard, caps lock, make sure we're in the right octave, we make sure we've got the right velocity we want, choose 16ths, put the player at the beginning of the bar, and... Uh, 
press the QWERTY key we want on our QWERTY keyboard. In this case, I'll put in E2. But <laughs> I've got to activate this step input monitor button, right? Once you've done that, highlight your step input keyboard like that and just press the key. Right, here we go, E2. Done. Decaps lock, toggle my keyboard off, there's my sixteenths. Drag them as short as I like. Yeah? So there you go. Step input keyboard, fantastic for putting in rows of notes. And, um, oh yeah, one other thing, of course, with the quote keyboard, you can put chords in, just the same as a real keyboard, because we can press multiple keys. So again, I'll put in chords at sixteenth, let's say. Put my player there, and um, put in my first chord. Rest, uh, as many times as I want, I'll put in just one rest chord, rest, chord, rest, chord, rest, chord. All done on the quarter keyboard. Play it. Yeah, because you can play multiple quarter keys at the same time to put in chords without the chord button. Brilliant. So there you go. Step input programming. Awesome power. Of course, um, if you really, really, really want to get into doing rows of notes, then what you really want to get into using is the arpeggiator, which is the real don around town when it comes to putting in these rows of notes, going da 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 da, -da and all that, right? But the thing is, the arpeggiator is quite deep, so I don't want to sort of stop in the middle of this piano tutorial and veer off at this very moment into doing the tutorial for the arpeggiator. But just to give you a taster, uh, you go to Window, uh, environment and the environment is this sort of hidden background area where all the bits that make up logic live and uh, we're looking at the mixer bits or components or objects at the moment and you go to new and you go new arpeggiator and there's your new arpeggiator and it has this little cable and you drag the cable out and plug it into the, your instrument track there we go close that so now I've got an arpeggiator plugged into this instrument track now do create new track. It doesn't matter what kind of track you create, right? Audio, software instrument, or MIDI, it doesn't matter. Create your track. If your library opens, close it. Now we have a track created. Hold down control, left click on the track, reassign it to mixer arpeggiator. And now we have an arpeggiator track tied to this instrument track. Now we get the pencil tool, we draw in an empty region on the arpeggiator track. And I shall just mute with the mute tool the region above on the actual instrument track so that anything on there doesn't play. So we now have this arpeggiator track with an empty region on it here, which we're now looking at in the piano edit. And this arpeggiator track is now sequencing this track because this arpeggiator track is tied with a cable to this actual instrument track. So this arpeggiator pattern, here it is, this empty region. I put my snap into bar beat or division, snap to absolute value on, I get my pencil tool, I draw a single note right across my grid. Like that, drag it right across and snap it to the very end. Like that, so I've got an exact bar length note going right across my bar. And that's it. And now with that arpeggiator track highlighted, I look at my arpeggiator panel here and I choose sixteenths with a length of 30 seconds and the arpeggiator is going to do all the chopping up for me. I haven't got to draw in a row of 16th notes and then drag them to be a 30 second in length. I just draw in a single note that fits right across my bar and the arpeggiator will chop it up into 16ths that are exactly a 30 second in length. I'll just put my tempo back to 120. Okay, and uh, here it comes. There you go. Perfect 16ths. Oh, you want it in 30 seconds, just change it to 30 seconds with a length of, say, 40 eighths. Oh, you want it in 64 fourths, fine, change it to 64 fourths with a length of 80, etc. So as you can see, the arpeggiator is really the master when it comes to these repeating fast patterns of notes and all this kind of da-da-da-da type things, you know, techniques. 
And why is that? Well, because the roots of all this repeating note type techniques is coming from the early days of electronic and dance music when it was all hardware sequences and arpeggiators built into synths and stuff, right? So, as I said, we will end the piano roll chapter with a full arpeggiated tutorial, and that's to look forward to. Uh, but for now, I'm off for a cup of tea, mate.